For nearly 2,000 years, the world has been turned upside down over what can only be called the most controversial book of all time. To its critics, the Bible is merely a combination of myth and legend mingled with history. But for those who believe in its sacred writings, it is the inspired and an errant word of God. A divine record that not only tells the way by which men get to heaven, but also warns of an eternal judgment for those who reject the light of truth found within. Jesus said, and this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. After he was crucified and raised from the dead, the followers of Jesus Christ went into all the world. To the Jews first, and then to the Gentiles, they preached that Jesus is the true Messiah, and that he suffered for the sins of men, according to the writings of the Holy Scripture. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. But Jesus himself had said to his disciples, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. The apostles also warned believers about seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and of certain men who would creep into the church with deception and lies. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Through the Middle Ages, many of the reformers came to believe that these warnings pertained to the rise of the Roman Church. In the book of Revelation, they saw the picture of Rome's apostasy presented as an unfaithful woman sitting atop a seven-headed beast. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints 
and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. But the Roman church did not rise up overnight. It came about one step at a time through the early centuries. If you look at your early church history, you had five patriarchates that came into being, Antioch, Jerusalem, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome. So you had five main church centers over the first couple of hundred years, but uh, Alexandria fell, and Jerusalem and Antioch also uh, fell early on, so you were left with Constantinople and Rome. So you had those two, but Rome gained the ascendancy in the West. There, there developed by the 4th, 5th, 6th century controversies among all the bishops in various parts of the world, especially Europe and uh, the Middle East. And whenever there was a controversy, some court had to decide what the answer is. And many uh, problems that arose early on, theological problems would then be sent to Rome to be looked at and answers given. While the New Testament church had begun in ancient Jerusalem and spread throughout the Gentile world, somehow the leadership of Rome dominated as the chief oracle in matters of debate. Well, you gotta remember the history of Rome. Uh, the Roman Empire was a great empire for hundreds of years, and the popes became the heirs to that kind of power. In the fifth century, one of the most well-known doctors of the early church, Augustine of Hippo, would make reference to a conflict that arose between certain African bishops. Augustine wrote, in this matter, Two councils have already sent letters to the Apostolic See, and from thence, rescripts have come back. The cause is finished. What Augustine was saying in that very famous statement, he was saying this, if Rome makes a decision, that settles it. So they needed a court, and uh, the prestige of the empire was in the city of Rome uh, by the, you know, Augustine's uh, time. And so that's all he's saying, he said, when we have an issue, when we have a difference of opinion, let's turn to Rome. In the centuries that followed, Augustine's statement would be paraphrased by the popes and doctors of the Roman church. His words were taken to mean, Rome has spoken, the matter is closed. In other words, if the church of Rome sets forth an opinion, all other churches must obey. Then, in the fifth century, the ancient empire suffered its decline and fell as it was sacked by the barbarian tribes that would reduce the city of Seven Hills to ruin. Rome was overrun by the Huns and the Attila the Hun, and so the whole system of the empire was defeated, and so the popes then began to take the place of the ancient Caesars, and so they came to take over not only uh, spiritual leadership, but also political leadership. And so Rome from then on uh, grasped at more and more power, and that's how the papacy really came into being. While the papacy did not spring up overnight, and there were many events that led to its development, the date most often looked to by Protestant historians is 606 AD, when the Roman Emperor Phocas named Pope Boniface III the universal bishop over all the Christian churches. This is when the papal power was said to be officially established in Rome. For a man to say that he is the true leader of all Christianity is not only unbiblical, but it goes completely against God's word 
and it opens a door for a control system to be set up that can control the world that Satan can use. And so I would say that this concept of a pope from the beginning was Satan's plan for man to manipulate the church in the name of Christ, but set up a system of anti-Christ or anti-Christian belief system.